All right, so a bit about our presenters this evening. Randy Pear is the survey field and documentation leader. Randy, a botanist, participated as a student in Hemis Mountain Plant Studies and most re recently worked as a Bureau of Land Management Environmental Quality Control staffer. Colleen Olinger um, helped to, has helped lead um, the, this project that we're going to talk about this evening since, two th two, since 2008, which is its very beginning. So she's been here the whole time. So I'm excited to have her in the room with us. Colleen has worked in historical and environmental areas at Bandelier National Monument and Los Alamos National Laboratory. She owns a local nature history publishing company. Awesome. Thank you both for being with us here with us this evening. And I'm going to head and I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to Colleen, who's going to start us off and um, monitor the chat for questions. Thank you so much, everyone. Enjoy. I'm trying to move it forward. Out. Right. Where did you tap it? Where did you tap it? Oh, okay. Would well, like to uh, welcome you all here. Uh, it's a well an, an ungodly hour to come to a talk when you're all hungry, but we're happy to have you. And what we would like to do is share some really nice things that we have found on the preserve through this uh, project. Many of you are part of the project. And uh, I think at the end, I'd like you all to stand. There've been a lot of people through the years and, and uh, really appreciate the work you all have done on this. And you know that the, uh, you know the preserve or you wouldn't have come. And, and that's uh, right next to Los Alamos, just up there. And if you'll notice with the preserve, <laughs> Let's get this. Not yet. I just wanted to say, that's fine. I just wanted to say that y you know the preserve. You know there's a lot of, of uh, meadows. There's a lot of trees. But you might have passed by just on the road. And you, and you may have walked in and walked in the meadows. We're going to try... We're going to try, uh, why can't I do that? It just, <laughs> we, we do well together. <laughs> so, so that you go in, when those of you who do go into the, to the Valle, usually go hiking in this, the beautiful, uh, uh, the beautiful meadows. And they are beautiful. They're just gorgeous. Even when, I want to go back. Oh. Okay. Even even when it's uh, dry, like it has been for the past few years, it's not dry now, but even then, it's really nice. And uh, so uh, there's a lot of trees in there, too. And in the trees, I'm going to try and show you this. Uh, if you notice in the trees, a lot of trees out there coming in. But look here. These are the aspens. And they're hidden by the trees. Or they're, they're actually being swamped by the trees now. And uh, the, the uh, Park Service, what well, wasn't the Park Service, the management people, they knew that. And they knew that, uh, that the uh, uh, dendroglyphs that were up there were probably dying out. And, the, and w what the history of that is, is they were during, particularly during the late... Um, uh, 19th century into the early, up until about World War II, there were a lot of sheep uh, up there grazing. There were loggers up there and, and various other people, and the they knew that the uh, that the the uh, trees 
if there were any carvings on the trees, which kind of a history, a history of people who don't have a voice up there, and they knew, and they knew they might be going. So what they did is, uh, these are some of the things that were are at an issue and were. Uh, this is uh, elk bites, and the elk can be quite problem as they go. I mean, they don't care if there's a there's a, a something there. And oh, I, and and next to the elk is uh, uh, fire. You, there's you can see probably fire on the top of that fire on the trunk of this tree, and and then and those are chronic up here where we are, and then old age. And I'm speaking from someone who knows old age doesn't stop, and it's just coming. And so the uh, park service. Uh, and at that time, it wasn't the park service, it was that wonderful local management service um, that they had for a while with with the Valle uh, uh, Grande Preserve. They decided that they really needed some people to to go out and see if they could find out what was left of the carvings that were on this tree be, and document it because that's the, they're not going to survive. And that, and that's, and so that's where our our group came up. And here they are. Uh, and this is, uh, I love this picture because it, you can be by yourself practically out there. And 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 if you'll notice, the aspens here are in amongst the the trees, and you're looking for aspens. Randy will talk about that later. Why? But you're looking for aspens. Now I want to ask you: Are these dendroglyphs? No, these are petroglyphs, and this one here is from uh, Mesa Mesa Prieta down down north of Española, and then the one down here at, at the bottom is El Moro, and that they are not dendroglyphs; they are older. And we want to show you more dendroglyphs. Are and sometimes they're called arborglyphs, bioteglyphs, and so. Is this a dendro? Does this have a dendroglyph on it? Well, we couldn't find it. <laughs> we look. You see, the, what you look is for things that aren't the same as the regular natural curves of the trees. But we thought there might be something there, and took a and took a picture. You think, well, this might be a dendroglyph, and you take a picture. Is this a dendroglyph? Is there one here? Yeah, isn't that beautiful? That's just a beautiful, beautiful carving. And see how nice that A is. Is this a dendroglyph? What's neat about this? This takes a, a, a lot more time to make than the ones where you have a single stroke. I know a guy named Luis Torres who grew up uh, with sheep in, not here, but over over uh, across the valley. And th so you had, they had to carve two sides, each two sides. Well, you can see it. I don't need to point it. And two sides, and it takes a lot more time. Occasionally, you'll find these. Not nearly as much as the other because it takes a lot more time. You have, to, you have a camp there. You might decide if you're going to be there for a while, you'll do this. But you're not just passing through to do this. One of the, uh, what we want, what I want to point out right now before Randy gets going on what we really found over the years, is that it's not all that safe always to go out. You're off the track. We don't find a lot of wild animals. We've just seen bears maybe three or four times, but they haven't come with us. But the downfall can really, really be a problem. And uh, it's, it, it's quite, particularly since some of the winds we've had lately, it can be a real problem. And, we ha and it slows us down. And we have to really watch. That's one thing that nobody ever thinks about but us when we go out there and and uh, you sh as part of the project. But you can find, but you can find, uh, other than on standing trees, you, which is pretty obvious, you can find, uh, you can find them, you can find uh, dendroglyphs on the ground. Here you see them on the grass. You can find them uh, under trunks. We found them under trunks and under there. And here's another looking under trunks. Under trunks is always quite fun. Sometimes they, 
squash like this like this one but still you can find some stuff you can still find some stuff out there and uh so we can't just look anywhere i mean we have to we have to look we have to be we can't just wander around saying how wonderful it is here and listen to the bird we have to really really be looking you can find it and these uh, are really good some of the men are uh, was well, some of the men aren't any better than women and women aren't any better than men some of the people can really find stuff underneath the tree it's fallen they look and then you look down and and then you put the pieces back up now those are not going to last you give a winter or two you won't have any of it here's two of them so that's one place you can you can find them well kit's here in the audience this is for you kit we went out and you can even find them high up. I used to think that you had to be on a horse to find them up. But again, Luis Torres said, no, you just pile stuff up uh, and you can find it. So here's Kit. She, she, we found this and Kit has the camera. And then how, what are we going to do? How do you take a picture of something that's really high up in the tree? So she went over, settled herself and took a picture. And she saved that it's documented that that dendroglyph is now documented that's not common but it's not that uncommon so i just wanted to give you a little introduction like that and randy's going to really take you in to what it, what it's like uh, what we found actually and how Okay, can everyone hear me? Okay. Um, I'm briefly going to go into a little bit of, of Aspen biology because it has some impact on, on what we do. As you can see on the upper left there, Aspen grow in clones. And biologists often use, you know, leaf turning or, or leaf putting out in the spring as a way to identify the clones because it happens at different times for different clones. The importance for that is that that entire clone is the same genetic thing. And as far as biologists are concerned, it's the clone that is the individual. So biologists refer to the aspen instead of as trunks or trees, they call them ramets. A ramet being the Latin term for a branch or anything that resembles a branch. So the importance for that is that um, um, the clone doesn't care how long one of these trunks lasts. You know, branches die on trees all the time, right? So it's typical for aspen not to live more than 150 at most, and it's usually down around 80 to 100. So um, that's one thing that's, uh, you know, caused all these trees to die is that the, the individual, the clone, doesn't really care if they die. And it doesn't put a lot of... Uh, chemical defenses in, um, which other trees use to keep off fungus and insects and all that kind of stuff. And aspen get a lot of really bad fungus infections really easily. Now on the lower right, I wanted to point this out. The reason that the aspen bark is that nice gray-green color, white-green color, is that the aspen bark actually photosynthesizes. So during the winter, during the summer, it doesn't much because it's being pretty much shaded by the leaves. But during the winter, the, the trunk photosynthesizes and it's sending sugars down into the root system. And that is why the elk like to chew on the aspen bark. <laughs> so that causes a lot of our problems. Um, in the time... In the time that I've been in with this project, about five years, we found at least two carvings on trees that have been lost within a, a couple of weeks or a month. You know, we've we found a, a, a dendroglyph on a tree and we've recorded it. And then a week or two later, we're going back by that same place 
and you know the trunk has crashed to the ground and all the bark is off shattered on the ground or something so this really is a, a temporary resource we need to get to while we can um, this is kind of how we actually record uh, record the dendroglyph um, of course we're taking photos but uh, we also have a whiteboard we use with the tree identification or the glyph identification number is up there the uh, GIS coordinates and uh, that will identify the whole sequence of photos that follows so we don't get don't get our photos mixed up and then we record as well as in photos we record all the data on this sheet and again we have all of the uh, identifying information up at the top um, where on the landscape you can find the tree um, the tree condition and I'd guess that 90% of ours are dead, probably. Um, and probably 20% of them are fallen or down. Um, and then we uh, write which side of the trunk it's on and what the size of the tree is and how high above the ground the glyph is. And all of that some provide some information as to how they're carved and why they're carved but also to help someone come back and find it in the future. <laughs> um, and then we make a drawing of the actual uh, in, uh, glyph and our interpretation of what it says. And so when we find one, one of the first things is to take a GIS reading. And then of course we have to use a magnetic compass um, to get the direction that it's facing. We uh, measure the circumference of the tree in the upper left there. And on the lower left, the height above the ground. And then uh, we take a bunch of photos. And that's Bob Dreiser, who's been the main photographer for the project for at least, what, the last 12 years or something? And again, as, uh, as uh, Colleen said, one of the tricks of the trade here is to pick up pieces of bark from the ground and try to fit them into what's left on the tree. And if you have something that goes under a fallen tree, you just have to get down on your knees and sometimes on your stomach, try to get in there and uh, try to figure out what it is. Um, just once in my five years, um, there were enough of us in a tree on the edge of a meadow, and the the tree was lying around the con along the contour, so we were able to actually get all of us along and roll the trunk over, <laughs> so that we could see what's on the bottom. Um, real difficulties uh, come from uh, broken bark. Um, I didn't mention in the aspen stuff, but as as the uh, bottom of the tree ages. Um, it's not being very efficient at photosynthesis anymore, and it's mostly shaded a lot of the time, so the tree starts putting out a, a thicker bark on it. Whoops. Um, and it, instead of looking like aspen bark, it looks very much like its close relative, the cottonwood. And, you know, the glyphs were written when it was a nice, smooth, green-white bark, and now it's all broken up into furrows and squares and stuff, and it's really hard to, to try to interpret what it was originally. Um, some of them are so bad that we start pointing at them because when you look at the photo, you can't really, <laughs> you can't really tell where the glyph is. What's the glyph? And uh, you see the same on the right there. We've got two fingers pointing at two lines of, of text. And uh, you notice... At the upper right, there's trees at a right angle, which indicates that this this is actually a log on the ground. But I I took the photo so as to get the lettering right side up. Um, we get lots of trees with really nice, beautiful, on the left, you can see, really nice, beautiful script. Um, sometimes think that some of the nuns in the Catholic schools must have done a really good job at it, teaching handwriting to some of these guys. 
And, you know, I couldn't write that neatly with pencil and paper, um, but these guys are carving into, you know, the bark with no eraser uh, at hand. Um, but mostly what we find is uh, block letters on the right. You can see this is Jose Inez Vigil. And uh, fortunately for us, a couple of our people, including Steve Daly in the audience tonight, uh, is more familiar with uh, Spanish and Mexican culture than I am. So he knew that it was not unusual to have Inez as a middle name. Um, but Jose Inez Vigil, and this letter, this lettering, of course, is vertical, so that you know the bottom of one letter is adjacent to the top of the next letter. Um, oftentimes, they were at the bottom of this particular glyph. Um, you can see coyote. I think the e has been uh, pretty much erased by that big crack in in the bark. But Coyote is, is the local town uh, where this person was apparently from. You know, it's up on the north side of the Jemez Mountains. Um, some other things we see, religious uh, images are common. On the left, at the lower part of that, you can see a pretty tall Christian cross. Uh, the middle upper photo you can see pretty clearly a, a Christian cross. And the bottom middle, that's what I always call the Maltese cross. I don't know if it is. <clears throat> the lower right, there's a big heart shape at the top, but it is connected to a cross on the bottom. And whoever found this and recorded it called that a sacred heart. But I don't know for sure about that. Everything else I've seen as a sacred heart has the cross inside the heart. Um, but um, And then, of course, at the top, we have the Star of David. And that leads into the whole story of uh, the crypto-Jewish population. You know, back in the late 1700s, when the Spanish first came to this area, this area was as far as you could get from the centers of power, you know. There was Spain and Madrid, and then way over there, there was Mexico and Mexico City. But this was way out in the boonies, you know. So if you wanted to get away from the powers that be, the mountains of northern New Mexico was a good place to go. Um, again, when once the bark gets broken up, it's really hard to make out what's going on. Whoops. Did I do something? Okay. Um, uh, we could see that there are, uh, you know, a bunch of kind of little lines here and some little lines over here and some lines up there at the top, lines on the left in a curve and lines on the right in a curve. Uh, and in the middle at the top, you can kind of see a, a, a roundish thing. And in the middle at the bottom, there's something that might be feet and we were having trouble figuring that out, and one of our volunteers, Steve Daly, had the sense to stand back about five feet. He said, I know what that is. <laughs> it's the Lady of Guadalupe. <laughs> um, so this next slide here, uh, our photographer, Bob Dreiser, drew in some of those lines. The, the Virgin of Guadalupe or the Lady of Guadalupe is always drawn with a uh, uh, radiant lines all all the way around her. Uh, another star of David. Uh, this is one of the glyphs by one of our favorite carvers. Uh, this is whoops. Um, you can see along the top, right at the very left, there's A-L, and then moving across E-J, and then the O is kind of broken by bark there. That's Alejo. And then underneath, the L's kind of lost on the left-hand side there, but U, uh, U, J, A, and N, with the N also kind of broken by the crack in the bark. Alejo Lujan. And we've found probably oh, 30 or so of his carvings. And it, 
various places uh, in, in the preserve, not just at one place. Um, one thing I like about him is that he draws very clear block letters. And the other thing I like about him, at the bottom you can see there is a date. And the month is, is, le- is lost to the left side of the photo. But you can see then a slash and a two and an eight. And then another slash and then 19, 20 something. <laughs> but what I really like about his dates is the way he does these slashes. He does these neat, shallow curves for all of his slashes. He shows up a lot. And I think one of the uh, slides that uh, Colleen showed earlier had uh, had us trying to fit pieces of bark from the ground up into the what was left of the tree on, on one of his carvings. Uh, we also find pictures of various things, uh, animals included. <laughs> Pauline's talking about the horse on the upper left. <laughs> and then uh, on the lower right, another horse uh, with more of the body shown. Uh, people. On the lower left is a gentleman smoking a pipe. Okay. And on the right, there is uh, still discernible, no, although not well, someone wearing a, a broad brimmed hat. And with apparently his right arm raised in greeting or something. And then, of course, two legs at the bottom. Now, all those pictures I just showed you, the horses and the two people, are typical of the pictures that are drawn there in the, that they are flat two-dimensional. There's been no effort to give them shading or anything to show this cheekbone standing out or, you know, it's just, you know, the way that young young humans these days start drawing pictures is they draw them flat. But one of our great finds recently was finding uh, this picture of a house or a cabin. And the thing that's unusual about it is it is in 3D perspective. You know, you can see the end wall with the door, we think, and then the side wall with door, maybe a couple of windows, um, and the roof line. And, and since it is three-dimensional, we think, and because of how it's aged, we think it is more recent than most of the other carvings. And the other thing that makes us think that, we were so taken with this and really took our time documenting it and kind of ignored all of the, the black bark above and below. Um, we see it all the time for where elk have chewed. But you look at this, and it's not just elk bites. And so my personal belief is that the drawer surrounded his carving by carving off the bark, possibly in an attempt to keep elk from chewing on his carving. You know, the elk would look at that tree and would say there's nothing much there. It was not totally effective because you can see at the right end of the front wall there, there's at least one elk bite within his drawing. Oh, and also one higher up on the roof, too. Um, one thing we see quite a bit is, I don't know if it's dyslexia or a limited time learning how to write, but we'll see letters drawn backwards. You can see the capital N is backwards and the capital D is backwards. Um, the end, the capital N being drawn backwards is probably the most common thing we see. Um, I don't think I've, besides this, seen a, a capital D before. But we also, as I note at the bottom there, we also find threes and capital E's drawn backwards, which can be a problem because a three drawn backward looks like a capital E, 
And a capital E drawn backward looks like a three. So um, you can usually tell if it's a three or an E, B, you know, whether there are other letter, letters around it or other numbers around it. Um, let me move back for a second. Um, you guys have probably all seen a picture of the original Declaration of Independence. And uh, uh, what's his name? Jefferson. Hancock wrote his signature, and he wrote these big swooping flourishes underneath it that run down about four inches down the page. Those things technically are called paragraphs, And we have found a couple of examples um, in our, in our uh, gender glyphs. This one is not terribly obvious. It kind of comes down from the left and goes across and then drops again, or comes down on the right end, goes across and drops on the left. And there are two slashes across it. And on the right side there, I've noted how we drew that, make it a little more clear. But, you know, it's kind of amazing that these guys think enough of their work to put a, a swoop underneath it, you know, and had the time, yes. Um, some other unusual things. This is, of course, vertical block letters, Julio. And Julio, the problem is that in Spanish, Julio can be a man's first name, the equivalent of Jules, or it can be the month July. So sometimes it's not always clear. In this case, there's you know no other numbers around it, so we're pretty sure that that's uh, the guy carving his first name, but it's not always that clear. And then the right picture up here is unusual. It's vertical lettering, but the letters have been turned sideways. So instead of the regular thing where the, the bottom of the J is adjacent to the top of the U, over here it's the side of the letters are uh, adjacent to each other, and you have to turn sideways to read it. And the other thing that's kind of curious here, and I don't know exactly why, but this tree did suffer some light burning, and the charring of the glyph actually made it stand out more. So that was a help. Um, some other things we've seen, we've found like, I don't know, eight or ten of these through the years. I've found four of them in just the last five years I've been associated with the thing. And inside an oval is kind of a numeral four with the left arm bent. And when I first saw that, and I think it was this uh, drawing on the upper left is the first one I saw, I thought, well, that's got to be like some Scandinavian rune or you know, maybe a letter out of one of the ancient Jewish alphabets or something like that. Um, we checked out both of those and didn't see anything like this. Um, the project as a whole has decided that that must be a brand. Um, I'm still not sure I buy that exactly. Um, but that's so far our interpretation. Uh, the bottom photo, you can see that elk bites have virtually erased the four, but you can also see that the left arm is not bent and that the uh, oval has heightened itself out into a more of a circle. And then on the upper right, you can see again, this is the normal oval with the, the four with the bent left arm, but it's not centered in the oval. And the only thing to the right of it looks like an elk bite. So. I don't know. It's we we don't know what it is. If anyone has any idea, <laughs> let us know. Um, the other one thing in in favor of it being a brand is that sheep were not branded. I don't think were they, Steve? Painted? Yeah, you wouldn't want to uh, you know, brand when you're planning on getting the wool from the animal. It would ruin the the fleece. Um, so this may, this may date you know, from the 1950s when it was more cattle. And uh, 
you know, in the earlier days too, if you wanted to brand anything, cattle or horses or whatever, it was usually a series of straight lines or, you know, one simple curve, you know, like you could use one iron to make a V shape, you know, and then maybe a curving iron to put a rocker under it or something like that. But it was putting together simple things and, um, Um, I was asked on the upper left there at the bottom of the thing. Are, uh, I'm sorry, it's the bottom photo and the bottom left of the photo. Oh, in the middle of the circle. Okay. Uh, to the left of the bottom of the four. Um, that does look like that could have been bear claws, yes. We have found uh, markings a lot where bears have climbed up the tree. Um, so we had religious symbols, we had pictures, and now we've got love is on the mind of lonely sheep, sheep herders. <laughs> so on the upper left there, we have a couple of hearts at least. Um, on the lower left, is the way we commonly see hearts today with, you know, a couple of uh, people's initials and then the date 1932. Um, up here, uh, the upper middle photo has a heart shape, but it's got two slashes through it. And we're not sure what that's supposed to mean. This, does this person have a broken heart? Are those supposed to be Cupid's arrows that have pierced his heart? <laughs> um, or, I guess I don't know the story of Christ well enough, but wasn't he stabbed in the chest with a spear or something when he was hanging on the cross? Um, I don't know if that's supposed to be that. Don't know. Um, if out in the uh, Zoom audience there are any young children, cover their ears for a moment. <laughs> Uh, the lower right is one of the uh, kind of uh, racy images that have been located. Uh, not the worst one, I don't think. Um, and then, again, let me uh, give an introduction to this. Uh, our photographer, Bob Dreisha, at the end of one day, while the rest of us were documenting a, uh, a dinderglyph, wandered off a little ways, and he came running back and he said, guess what I found? <laughs> and this is the most unusual thing I have yet seen to date. In the middle of that trunk to the left of the notebook, there is a human figure with the head on the left and what, her left arm raised up above, the right arm down below, and it looks like you know, her legs have kind of merged together. So... Our interpretation is that's a mermaid. Um, I don't know where Spanish sheep herders in northern New Mexico would have heard about mermaids. <laughs> um, and I also am kind of struck by the way that the carver used natural features of the trees. These two things that look like eyes were not carved. That's natural variations in the trunk. And then lower down on the chest, there's another couple of bumps that, that were not carved, that were there already. Um, we also, in our wanderings around the wood, find other resources that we report back to the preserve. This was a, a big stock pond, probably dating from the 1950s, that was way up almost on the top of a ridge. And uh, Steve and I talked a little bit about where the water for that thing comes from because it does not have much of a watershed. Um, and there were, you know, lots of signs of the elk using this pond. We've also found probably five or six different springs that were nowhere on the uh, preserve maps. So we, re we send all that information into the hydrology group. So what do we do with all this data? <laughs> well, this happens after the field. So this wouldn't be a normal part of, of working on this volunteer project. But we uh, 
start putting all the data into Excel spreadsheets. And each one of these lines in the Excel spreadsheet represents one carving. And there's, uh, I think, going all the way across, there's got to be something like 40 columns that we fill in. This is kind of just the middle of it. Um, uh, the direction it faces on the left, and then the height above ground, and next over, and then the, uh, what do you call that? The circumference. <laughs> next, and tree condition, and then bark condition. And then the ones in purple are more the specifics of the uh, of the carving in terms of what's actually there. And uh, kudos again to Anna Stefan of the Park Service because she's kind of standardized this, um, has created uh, wild cards or whatever, you know, if you can't make out something, what do you put in this, you know, spreadsheet? And that was a real service. Um, I did say that family names is one of the most common things that are found. And uh, only 21 of the names are inscribed in 10 or more glyphs. And those 21 names comprise 60% of the uh, family names that have been found. Uh, Lujan up there, Alejo Lujan, is the second most common. Um, and it helps to know a little bit about Spanish culture and at least read the newspaper because before I came here, I don't think I knew what C. de Baca was down there at the bottom. Um, I, I wouldn't have known that that was a surname. Uh, towns and cities is again as common. I pointed out where one of them had coyote, but Cuba's the most common and uh, you can read down there. Some uses of data. Uh, the next few slides will be some of the analytical work, but this is office work done long after the survey. So um, any uh, people that volunteer for this project would not get involved in this. But they've uh, kind of mapped the hometowns where these uh, heap herders have come from. That's the place names. Um, okay. And then... Again, our photographer, Bob Dreige, has done a little bit of this, but someone else has done a lot more. Um, if someone was hired to, uh, to tend sheep, it wasn't their sheep. It was probably the sheep were probably owned by Frank Bond and son. And uh, so that's some of the ledgers, you know, who they assigned, how many sheep to, and so forth. And then you can go into the census records and try to find those names on those dates. And... Uh, get some of that information put together as is shown on the lower left. Um, also mapping people on the, on the preserve. The guy that's denoted by the purple here has, you know, glyphs all over the place pretty much. Whereas the guy that's denoted in yellow is limited to the lower left corner down there. Um, overall, 3,000 Glyphs uh, have been identified on 2,400 trees. Approximately 40% of the preserve has been surveyed. And some of that, what's shown in the, on the slide here is a light uh, gold color, has been surveyed by professional archaeologists. All the rest of it is this volunteer team. Um, for the last five years that I've been working, we've been working in the center area outlined in blue. And the numbers that we found are included in that 3,000, but uh, I didn't have time to go in and put in the dots. So the dots of what we found in that blue thing are not there. Okay. I'm gonna turn it back over to Pauline now.
Okay. So of those uh, of those uh, that have been recorded, our volunteer uh, total for everyone, and there were people recording before we started. Some volunteers. Uh, they are. Uh, we are approximately two thousand, and this is just since two thousand eight. And uh, we can't go out every day or even every week. There are there are climate things and other things that might prevent it. I would like to mention uh, two things. One, in 2010, we, this team, got an award from the Michelle Obama Top 10 Outdoor Volunteer Teams. And we were on it. And... And I would like to acknowledge, too, um, doc, Dr. Anna Stephan. She, she's our, our head to enchilada, really. And she started it, and she tells us where to go, and we have to report to her. And, and I, I do want to acknowledge her, that, that she, she's the, uh, the head enchilada. And some of the material from today uh, came out of this pamphlet that she wrote and uh based on the a lot of the stuff that we based on a lot of the stuff that we had sent in and i think you can get this up at the preserve if not uh it it's it, as far as we know it's open literature and uh, i have it on my our, our internet and it it's got a lot of some of what you you saw today up here it was a PowerPoint, yeah. Right, and then put our own slides in that nobody till tonight has seen. Okay. Well, we need people. We need people to go out with us. Uh, it's a grueling, it can, week after week, you don't have to go out every week, but it's just really, really nice experience you're out there nobody's looking over your shoulder and you're off at where people just don't go very much as your chance to go not only that it's a chance to be with really nice people and uh, just really nice people some of you are in here can you stand up please don't be shy Yay! And so you're working out there, and you're with people, and 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 you're in the outdoors, and, and it's just really nice. And so please, if you do, I'm not saying please. I'm saying take your opportunity <laughs> for your sakes, and of course for our for for the good of history. Yeah, all. Good. Just again, really nice people out there. You might notice on this, um, we need to point out, can see. We need to point out here, they're married. <laughs> but, but nice. And then finally, I'm going to end. And uh, if you have any questions, please, uh, please ask us. But we had some particularly nice people. This is Dorothy Horde and uh, and um, Becky Hardy. They had decided, and she was with us for years, and they had decided that they would be it would be a pink day for them. They would put pink clothes on, and they did. And here they are having fun hitchhiking up there in in the valley. And they, I don't think they'd have done it just along the main road. So that that's something to just meet nice, nice folks. So if you do want to get in touch, uh, Randy's name is there and my name is there, and uh, just the, our emails are there, and you can you can get in touch with us. I would like this is the final slide. I would like you to notice not only the beautiful clouds, there's a fire. It it is it shows that fire has gone through. Oops, what did I do wrong? Well, we all know about fire. 
and a fire went through, has gone through, and so there's just, just, uh, it's real need to get these before the fire. We've had over half, maybe uh, thir- two thirds of where we've been, have has been burned over. And once it's burned over, we tried once to go. Dorothy and I went back in to see where we had had a lot that we had recorded, and we went back. We couldn't read them, and we knew they were there. So anyway, thank you for coming, uh, and again, particularly for all of you for coming, but for those who've helped out over the years, thank you. And I want to thank you all. Oh, any questions? The only thing that grows. Correct. The, the glyphs do not uh, go grow up above the ground. Only grass does that. All of the trees grow at the top, and, and the top gets taller, but the bottom stays where it is. It's only grasses that grow from the bottom. Well, you know, for a while we thought that those that are higher up were done because the sheep herder was on a horse. Um, but after Colleen talked to that gentleman, she mentioned, um, we think that they were, maybe they were trying just to get up above where the elk chew. Um, and they would pile up stumps or branches or something to get up that high. Yes. Um, the question is, is there anywhere else in the world where sheep herders have left these carvings? I don't know about the world. Um, a friend of mine lives up in Durango, and about 10 years ago, she was doing a similar project on the Forest Service land up there. Um, in uh, Utah and Nevada, there were Basque sheep herders that were brought in as opposed to the local Hispanics. And up in Idaho, and did they do carvings? Yes, they did carvings also. And uh and Australia. Um well all those in the US I think were Aspen. Actually within the preserve there's a couple of uh ponderosas that had glyphs on them. I have not seen those. Um but the Aspen, you know, made a, a good, you know, sketching material, I guess. Um, I, I've read, I've rode the uh, Coombers and Toltec Railroad a bunch of times, but only a couple of years ago when I was there with a friend, did she point out that along the, the railway there, many of those trees are carved by people that built the railway. So keep an eye out for that if you, um, next time you go up there. Yes. Hmm, that's weird. Uh, hold on a minute. The question was, uh, someone that gave tours up on the Valle talked to someone who uh, thinks that she saw in the Valle earlier earlier years, uh, Glyph saying Kit Carson. Oh. Oh. If, if that's true, and she did say it, it, he didn't do it. He died, I think, in 1871, something early 70s. And Kit, uh, that tree wouldn't be alive. It wouldn't have been there. But somebody might have just put Kit Carson. But it wasn't Kit. Okay. Uh, 
Kristen, do we have any Zoom questions? Okay. Anyone else local here? <laughs> We're hoping at the end of this month, um, our uh, our NPS contact, uh, Dr. Anna Stefan, has been having some health problems, and we've not been able to get things organized yet, but she's working on it. <laughs> um it's it's varied um usually once a week and for the last few years we've been alternating a saturday for one week so that the working stiffs can go and then the next week it'll be a weekday and alternate like that um when covid first hit we were only allowed to take like four people at a time and uh, in order to provide enough opportunities for all the volunteers to get out there, I had to set up a rotation, and we were doing it twice a week um, just because we had so few people, um, and we weren't covering as much ground each time. Uh, and, you know, the, the survey method, we're not doing a, a sampling. Like, I worked for the Forest Service doing forest inventory work, and we didn't count and measure every tree out there. You know, we took samples. And then uh, my boss drew statistical inferences from those samples. Here we're trying to actually look at every single aspen tree <laughs> on the preserve. Um, and I know we missed some. But but uh, the, the normal survey day, we'll drive in on one of the roads as close as we can get, and then we'll usually have to walk a half a mile or something to get to our surveys area. So, you know, we're like a Boy Scout troop walking along, you know, hopefully not, maybe a logging road, maybe an elk trail, or maybe getting cross country. And then once we get to the survey area, we spread out in a line abreast and kind of walk parallel tracks through that survey site and Anytime anyone finds one or isn't sure about one, they'll radio on the walkie-talkies, and we all gather at that one point. And then uh, we also have whistles, um, which sometimes works better than the walkie-talkies, um, especially when you're trying to tell people where you're standing. You know, well, I'm in this valley. It's got trees around it. <laughs> so if you blow a whistle, it's much easier for people to find you. Um, and then once you're through with that tree, either positive or negative, we try to spread back out in our line again and, and keep the survey going. Before we start, we have a, a big meeting. Well, it's a big meeting. We have a meeting at uh, our house my husband's right here, his and I, and so, but our house, we have a big meeting where we find out where do you want to go, what day of the week do you want to go, and and things about them, that, that the things that the volunteers might want us to know, and then that you have to sign papers, park service papers, and, uh, and we pass those out, and we take care of that, so the, the next thing that will happen is that uh, there will be that meeting. And and then we'll know, you'll know more about what's going on, but we don't know right now. All right, we don't have any other questions in the room. Um, we're about 10 after now, so um, I'm gonna wrap it up and maybe people in the room, if you have more questions you would like to ask, we're gonna ask it after we end the Zoom. But I just wanted to give a very big thank you for Colleen and Randy uh, for sharing this project with us tonight. Those were, it's just very wonderful. Thank you so much. I know this has been a long time in the making for me to bring you here. So thank you for being here.